Welcome to the St. Louis University Craft Talks, part of the St. Louis Literary Award series of programming with our host, Ted Iber, and special guest, Howard Schwartz. The St. Louis Literary Award was created by the Library Associates of St. Louis University in 1967. To learn more about the Literary Award and the writers that we have honored over the years, check out the book, The St. Louis Literary Award by St. Louis University Archivist Emeritus, John Wade. We would also like to thank our sponsors for the Craft Talk series, Left Bank Books and Caldi's Coffee Roasting Company. Left Bank Books is one of the oldest and largest independently owned bookstores in the nation, offering a full line of new and used books, gifts, cards, magazines, toys, and services. You can order Howard Schwartz's books at a 20% discount if you let them know that you saw this interview. Caldi's Coffee Roasting Company is dedicated to creating a memorable coffee experience for their customers and guests, committing to sustainable business practices, providing educational opportunities, and supporting the communities in which they serve. And now, without further ado, Howard Schwartz. Howard Schwartz is a prolific writer and recipient of numerous literary awards, having published many works of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry for both adults and children. In searching for themes and images for his work in various genres, he has often found his inspiration in biblical, midrashic, and Kabbalistic lore. Many of Howard's works retell ancient folk tales, reflecting his belief in the importance of passing cultural lore from one generation to the next. His poetry frequently reflects the dreamlike and mysterious elements of Jewish mythology. Howard Schwartz's fictional works, as typified in the collection of parables titled The Captive Soul of the Messiah, are in part original, in part recreations of ancient legends, a conjunction of personal search and dreaming with mythical or timeless patterns or cycles, reported Francis Landy in the Jewish Quarterly. As a result, Landy explained uh, Howard's stories are at once familiar, filled with the aura of the sages, giving the impression of a blind and insatiable uh, predilection for the alleyways of tradition, and at the same time being wholly pertinent, incisive metaphors for our own predicament. All right, with that introduction, I want to officially welcome Howard Schwartz, uh, writer uh, and professor and someone who I have admired from a distance for a long, long time. I'm so excited to have you here at Craft Talks at St. Louis University. Welcome. Okay, Ted, thank you very much. So, Howard, I wanted to start with some questions on writing process first. So, as I mentioned in the introduction, you said that you're inspired by biblical, midrashic, and Kabbalistic lore in your retelling of ancient folk tales. And that you've driven to pass culture, or that you're driven to pass on cultural lore from one generation to the next by amassing these stories into anthologies of Jewish literature, including publications such as Elijah's Violin and other Jewish fairy tales, Miriam's Tambourine, Jewish folk tales from around the world, and Tree of Souls, the mythology of Judaism, among others. So here's the question How do you determine which story goes in which collection? Well, usually uh, when I'm working on a, a collection, that will be the collection. I, I won't think about what's going to come in the future. Uh, but I was looking for certain types of tales uh, with my four collections of Jewish folk tales. I was looking, Elijah's Violin is a book of Jewish fairy tales. Mm-hmm. Uh, Miriam's Tambourine is a book of general folk tales. Lilith's Cave, uh, Jewish Tales of the Supernatural, uh, is a book of specifically Jewish tales of the supernatural and especially of the demoness Lilith. And the fourth book and final in the series, Gabriel's Palace, is a book of Hasidic tales. So a follow-up to that, how how do you even identify the stories that you want to use in the first place? Because I would imagine that is in itself a challenge. You know, all of this is built on my past reading. Uh, when uh, I was a kid, I was spending a lot of time reading fairy tales, especially the Rainbow series. And, and by the time that I was doing this, uh, 
and that is to say uh, around 1978. Um, I had a very strong sense of what was what. Now, the way that I have to tell you that I got into this business of retelling uh, accidentally. Mm. What, what happened is I was working on a huge anthology of Jewish poets. The book is called Voices Within the Ark, the Modern Jewish Poets. And I was looking for an Ethiopian poet uh, because I understood that there were a few in the world mm -hmm. and I wanted to include every everyone, uh, every type of... Uh, so I asked everywhere I went, do you know of an Ethiopian Jewish poet? And everyone said, I don't. But the only person in Jerusalem who knows this is Professor Dov Noy. So finally, I called up Professor Dov Noy, and uh, I explained to him the problem. He said, okay, I'll be glad to talk to you. Come here on Monday night at 9 p.m. So I came there at Monday night at 9 p.m., and I was astounded to see that there were 50 other people because so many people had questions for him that uh, they, they all came the same night at the same time. And then he had us crowd into his living room and introduce ourselves. Um, now, uh, Noe, for some reason, took a liking to me. And so he invited me to come to his house after that on days other than Monday night, 9 o'clock. I still came on Monday at 9 because it was amazing. <laughs> but I, this way, I, I would come over and it would be just him and his wife. And he then proceeded to tell me about his great accomplishment, which was to start the study of Jewish folklore in Israel. And he had created an archives, uh, which had something like 20,000 stories in it collected from people all over Israel. And they would say who they were collected from and who was the collector. And they'd all be given a number. And uh, finally, my wife and I went to Haifa, where his archives was, called the Israel Folktale Archives. And we would start to pick, and we would start looking through the stories. One of the stories that I came across was called Elijah's Violin. And I thought, wow, that's a great title. You know, wouldn't it be great to have a book called Elijah's Violin? And then I started focusing on this idea of a book of Jewish fairy tales. And uh, I was able to work on that by first, you know, reading uh, the stories that he had collected and that he had published in little uh, books. And then uh, beyond them, uh, I started moving into the medieval period, the Hasidic period, and then the Midrash period. This, these are the rabbinic commentaries on the Bible, but there are fairy tales there too. And uh, I ended up with, uh, I think, just 36 stories in Elijah's violin. Um, I got the best advance I ever got from the publisher. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, the, the artist did a great job. And that book... The illustrations are beautiful. Yeah. That, that book uh, changed my life in that this now was by purpose to collect these stories. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. May, may I ask, when, when you were doing the collecting, were the stories universally in Hebrew? Were they, in, or were some in English? Uh, they were written primarily in Hebrew. Um, but uh, they were in a whole variety of languages. I, I, after working on the poets, I be, had become sort of good at finding uh, the right material from other other cultures. So you um, 
said once upon a time that uh, that Elijah's violin is one of your most gratifying works because you could balance research with creative writing by finding pieces of the stories that were often fragmented and required a leap to fit them together into one archetypal version. So how do you structure your research collection and writing process versus more like your creative writing process? All right. Well, I, I, my basic rule of thumb was try to find three versions of a story. Mm. Uh, Noy in his archives in some cases has a hundred versions of the same story. Wow. Uh, but I, I, I needed three to work with. And I learned about this from, uh, Italo Calvino's introduction to, uh, Italian folk tales, where he says that he, his role was to find three versions and then, uh, work those three into one. Uh, so I did the same thing. And, uh, that worked extremely well. So you've said that you're, um, I'm continuing on, by the way, with the writing process. You've said that you're often inspired by dreams when writing. From what other sources do you draw inspiration? And I'm going to add, how does your inspiration differ when you're writing poetry versus novels versus essays or collecting anthologies? Okay, the full, the full, uh, best <laughs> yeah, That's a very <laughs> good question that we could probably spend the entire time on. When I, first started writing about 1965. I think at that point it was because I broke up with a girlfriend and I just sat down and typing some angry stuff. But then I discovered I had written a poem. Uh, so that amazed me. And that summer I must have written a hundred poems. It's about 1965. Also, I started keeping a dream journal. I, w I had an unusual ability, which I no longer have, uh, of remembering my dreams. So I would write them down. And in fact, in the end, I ended up with 40 years of dreams. Oh, wow. That's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and of course, they're, they were very re revealing. I think that part of my uh, building up to this work in Jewish folklore came from the dreams uh, and started to see how my dreams were f following folk patterns. Um, anyway, that was one and very important element. I was also a obsessive lover of Franz Kafka and studying Kafka constantly, mm -hmm. and also George Luis Borges. Uh, those are the two that inspired me the most. And I guess I wrote stories in some way uh, that were triggered by their stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, I was working then on dreams, poetry, uh, and then prose. Around 68, I started writing short stories, very short stories, parable like. Um, I, then I, what happened in 1976, uh, I did my f very first book, which is called Imperial Messages, uh, 100, uh, modern parables, modern parables, yeah. That was the only book that wasn't a Jewish book. Uh, it was from reading all over. And my technique was to wander the fifth floor at Old Library and to pull out thin books. <laughs> and those thin books frequently contained parables. And so uh, Imperial Message is actually the first collection of parables. Mm -hmm. um, that book uh, was published as a paperback by Avon Books. Uh, it was really very successful. And even to this day, there are people who say to me, the one book I really depend on is Imperial Messages, although I'm sure it's torn to pieces by now. <laughs> um, so 
and, and then I, you know, this stuff became more and more focused on the Jewish dimension. I had friends who were teaching me about uh, Judaism. I had this powerful sense of being Jewish from my father. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, it seemed to me like I was just being pulled in this direction. Uh, by the time that Elijah's violin came out and I went back to Israel and I took a walk with Dov Noy and I handed it to him, he was so happy with it. And he, he felt that, uh, uh, that this was the first time that his archive stories had been collected along with the traditional stories. Mm -hmm. That they were together in one book and he went carefully through my contents and he was very happy with it. So I felt like that was a success. I got very good uh, um, reviews of the book. Uh, and I thought, well, this, since this works so well, I'll just go in this direction. Right. And thank you, Dad. <laughs> yeah, sure. So you've got a children's book coming out next year uh, titled, uh, is it still titled All You Need? All You Need. Okay. The story is accompanied by some really remarkable illustrations by the artist Jasu Hu. How did you connect with, with, uh, with Jasu Hu on this project? And what is it like to collaborate with other writers that bring your work to life? Because I know you've been doing it throughout your career. Well, it, it's a great pleasure to work with artists. And I have tried to do it throughout my career. Um, in this case, since I'm not currently writing poems, about the last poem that I wrote was this one called All You Need. And that was after I had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about what we need in order to be alive. And I wrote a, a short poem called All You Need. And uh, I sent it to my agent. And she sent it to uh, a children's publisher. And the fellow that it went to really liked it. And he then moved to another children's publisher. That were, uh, the books, you know, are his books in, in effect. Mm -hmm. And he somehow found this Chinese young poet. Uh, and she had never published anything before. But as you and I both realize, she was fantastic. <laughs> and she then did this book, which is a book about, you know, really kind of from a child's point of view, uh, about what you need in this world. And she wrote it about her life in China. And it w worked perfectly. Uh, so... Mm -hmm. That's how it happened. It was all done through the agent and the editor. I never uh, met her. I actually haven't communicated with her except to tell her that she did an incredibly wonderful job. That's great. So um, I, I wonder with this next question if it changes depending on uh, the genre in which you're working, but do you have any writing habits or rituals that you participate when you're sitting down to work? Well, I'll tell you, this is, in all honesty, um, three years ago, I finished what I was pretty sure to be my last book. Mm. Uh, it, it was, it's a book of the stories of Rabbi Nachman of Bratislava, mm -hmm. uh, the greatest true storyteller. But since those three years, we, we moved, uh, and, uh, uh I, everything is different. Um, so I stopped writing poems and I stopped working on projects. And just that I was lucky that that all you need was a, a nice final project. And was, is that related more to, I mean, was that decision made because of your stroke or just because you felt like the, the you know, that you well, were... I, I, I'm now 75. Mm hmm. I think I did something like 40 books. Yeah, it's, you have a remarkable number of books. <laughs> right. I think that I simply w got worn out. Right. I, I didn't have the 
desire, which I've always had, to write. Um, now, though, you know, there are some fortunate things like this interview. There's uh, four Zoom retellings of some of my fairy tales and folk tales. So some good things are happening, even though I myself am not active. The breadth of your work um, is is staggering. It's it's just it's so incredibly impressive, and even just I mean even even just Tree of Souls uh, is such a massive undertaking. Um, that had that been your only book, had that been your only anthology, that in itself would be impressive because I believe that that will live on forever. Hey, thanks uh, a lot. Let's uh, hope Oxford the feels the same way about it. <laughs> Um, I worked on Tree of Souls for 12 years. Normally, it took me four years to do a project. Uh, that one, obviously, was a much harder project. Uh, Howard, it's staggering. And even just looking through the footnotes um, for the stories, and I, I mean, I just was, I, I was blown away when I was going through it. Thanks. Um, I so, appreciate. so twelve years is 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 a is an enormous amount of time. But I but but it was I thought yeah okay I get it. <laughs> it makes sense when when you're going through the work. Uh, it's gorgeous. Um, so all right. So just as when uh, as a writer, what did you? Because I, I ask this in, in every every interview that I have with 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 writers or with, with any kind of artists about what what's the most joyous part of the process of of making your work or, or, and, or the most painful. Or well, the most joyous part of the process is when the first copy of the book arrives. Yeah. Because that's what you, what I've been focusing on. I'm uh, doing all the things that you need to do. And then all of a sudden it's a book and, uh, it's a great feeling. For me, that was a great feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, I want to move on to some questions on writing style. So you've written novels, and you've got this very large number of anthologies, Jewish folklore and mythology for both children and adults. How do you make decisions regarding voice and tone when you're writing for children? And, and you did elaborate on this a little bit, uh, like when you wrote before you were born, um, and when writing for adults, as in A Blessing Over Ashes. So how do you, like, when you're making it, that decision between voice and tone for children versus adults? Right. Well, uh, I didn't do the first book, the children's book, until the late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, I, I decided that I wanted to do it, a book of children's stories, but I didn't really know how to do it. Uh, so I turned to my friend, uh, Barbara Rush, and uh, she was a librarian who also wrote children's stories. And so we collaborated on my first book for children, which is The Diamond Tree. And we got, again, a wonderful response to that book. Mm -hmm. uh, what I learned from that book is that I can think like a child. I can, you know, tell a story like I was speaking to a child. Uh, I guess I'm part of, partly a child, but uh, that's what that's what worked for me. And uh, the book was so successful that I think I've done uh, eleven others since then. Mm. I, I love your titles. When you know, I talk to my students about the importance of a good title, whether you're writing a, an essay for a class or you're working on a on a on a book. Um, do you, uh, over your career, was were you a brainstormer of titles, or are you a brainstormer of titles? Or well, normally they would just you know be obvious to me, mm -hmm. like a big exit sign or something. <laughs> um, but in the case of my book Gabriel's Palace, I couldn't figure out the right title, so I made a list of a hundred possible titles. Exactly, and but I, I went, tell my students, I love that. Okay. Uh, and I went through it, and then it became obvious to go with the title, Gabriel's Palace. Uh, it was part of a series, Elijah's Violin, Miriam's Tambourine, Lilith's Cave, 
but the fourth one had to be within that uh, structure. Mm-hmm. And uh, I couldn't figure out what it should be. I mean, there there were titles that, which were not original, like Jacob's Ladder, mm-hmm. uh, but I didn't want to use anything like that. But one of the stories in the book is Gabriel's Palace. It's one of the important stories. And finally, I when I found that, everybody was happy. You've um, so you've organized Tree of Souls, the mythology of Judaism, into ten distinct books or or movements. How did you create these categories? And can you describe the experience of choosing which story to place where? Okay. Well, sometimes it was very hard to decide. I, I would imagine there were a few cases where it could have been one of two or one of three different categories. The story with Tree of Souls is that it goes back to fourth grade. Uh, in fourth grade, they gave us a big LaRousse anthology of world mythology. And I went through the contents, and I you know, saw all the obvious ones, the Greek, the Roman, the Norse, the Chinese, but I didn't see anything that said Jewish mythology. I, I was extremely interested in mythology. So I raised my hand and said, but where's the Jewish mythology? And the teacher pointed at me and said, there is no Jewish mythology. And she said it like that. Yeah. So I repeated this question every year while I was still in middle school and high school. Mm-hmm. All of them said the same thing. There is no Jewish mythology. But by then I had been reading uh, Camp and Jung. Mm-hmm. and uh, people like that. And I was convinced there had to be a Jewish mythology that they were resisting the idea because uh, they were resisting it because they didn't want to mess with the Bible. They didn't want to say openly that the Bible is a book of mythology. They couldn't take that, even though I think that it's Inconvert, I don't know what's the word. Uh, you can't, can't argue with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, since I had just finished those four collections of folklore, Lodge's Violin, Miriam's Tambourine, Lilith's Cave, and, uh, Gabriel's Palace, there were, there was nothing more for me to do in that, in those categories. Uh, I, now, then I remember this lifelong struggle uh, to try to find if there was a Jewish mythology. And I started visiting with Jewish scholars, and I asked them to uh, give me their opinion of what stories in Judaism uh, were mythological. Mm-hmm. And they did. Uh, and I, I actually went to Israel at one point and I met with a lot of the major scholars, including Gershom Scholem, uh, the greatest Jewish scholar of Kabbalah. And they all gave me their opinions. So I finally made a giant list of all the stories that were mythological. And I started asking myself, what are the categories of this mythology? And it was obvious that the major one was the myths of God, since God plays such a central role in Judaism. Um, and then I little by little uh, came up with the remaining 10 uh, categories. And uh, from that point on, I worked on one category at a time. I read as much as I could in the Talmud, which is five volumes, uh, and the Midrash, which is about a hundred volumes. And uh, then I moved on to the Middle Ages, where there were, uh, again, many, many collections. And then I went you know, from a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, things like that. Um, and little by little in these twelve years, it 
started Tech Farm. I got a contract from Oxford because I had done the previous four books with them. And uh, I, I just kept working on it till it was ready. And uh, went to New York carrying this big hunk of uh, paper with me and showed it to me. It turned out to be a day that was raining nonstop, so I was all wet. And I sat with my editor, and she looked through it, and I, she said, but you have the notes following the stories. Why? And I said, the notes on the stories are as important as the stories themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want them to follow the story in the book. Uh, and what they came up with was a change in the typeface size. Um, the story is somewhat larger than the notes, but that was very important. Uh, so it was a wonderful process. Um, and uh, I guess that was my peak. That book won the National Jewish Book Award. One, one of at least three times that you won that, I know. Right, but uh, that was the most important. Yeah. The, other, the others were for children's books. Um, so after that, that was, like I say, my peak. And then I had other projects I was following up with. I want um, to have a couple of questions more related to poetry. You've published five books of poetry and right. a number of your poems, including Descent and Song, are chiastic in structure, meaning ending where they began. With the former using the image of a closed door at both the beginning and the end of the poem, and the latter using song. So can you discuss your thoughts on how subject and form are related for you in poetry? Well, early on, I decided that I wanted to invent a form for a poem. But I ended up coming up with, although I don't think I actually ever did it, was three lines, haiku-like poem. Mm -hmm. Six lines, two haikus. Stance break. Stance break after the three, after the six, and then uh, three lines to finish the poem. And that the uh, images in the first three lines would reappear in the six lines and the three lines. Mm -hmm. And just the idea that I was working on a, a structure. Uh, I, meant that it, I always kept in mind uh, that I was looking for a structure. And I, I, I tried to give some kind of a structure to all my poems. I certainly revised them endlessly until I did, could do that. I even at one point spent a year on one poem, uh, Called the one called the skeleton tree, but in the end, I didn't put it in the select poems <laughs> because it was basically a tremendous learning experience. It was twelve stanzas uh, with four lines in each stanza, uh, but the structuring. So what I always told my students on the first day of class. I can't teach you to write poems. What I can teach you is how to revise poems. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, you, you know, I, learning, and it's, it's a painful lesson, but, but oftentimes what ends up on the cutting room floor uh, is every bit as important as what ends up being published because you, didn't, you won't necessarily get to the published material without first going through the work that needed to be cut out. Right. Uh, and that's a great example of it. Um, you know, it's, I've, I've spoken to several other poets uh, within the series who have all commented on what a what a great time it is to be a poet because there's so much freedom to work on form and structure. You know, it's not necessarily the forms that um, that have been kind of set for hundreds of years. Not not that those are not that those are bad. I mean, they they've got staying power for a reason, but that that poets are more. They're willing to be more adventurous now, uh, maybe than earlier, uh, and yeah. break out of those old, older molds. 
I, I agree with that. Keep in mind that the first thing that I wanted to be was a poet. Uh, that I started writing in 65 and I didn't have the first book come out till 76. Um, that I, in my mind, the important thing was to be a poet. All of these other things that came out, uh, came out because of Dove Noy. Uh, that he awoke, you know, for me, the existence of this tremendous, these tremendous, uh, categories uh, and types of material in Jewish lore. Uh, so, and as it happened, that year was, 1978, 79. And I also met my wife in Israel and then. We're still married. And, uh, that was, you know, it, my, my life can be pointed out in, in about four or five turning points. And that certainly was a turning point. Uh, the mystery is why Noy liked me so much. I was simply at that point doing an anthology of 400 Jewish poets. Uh, but somehow he saw my potential in making use of his archives. And, uh, and he was right. He was right. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to him. So you said in the introduction of Elijah's Violin that there are examples of Jewish folklore, and I quote, which can readily be identified as fairy tales. How does Jewish folklore differ, in your opinion, from other common fairy tales, like what we would maybe find in Grimm's fairy tales? Well, first of all, God almost always plays a role in the Jewish fairy tales. Uh, that's not the case in other fairy tales. There it's the white princess or uh, something like that. Um, you know, some kind of supernatural element mm -hmm. that appears uh, in, in pretty much every story. And, and remember that I was the kind of kid who was laying on the floor in the basement, uh, reading books of Jewish fairy tales and laughing. Um, it, it, it just, it was, that was it. It, it grabbed me. Mm -hmm. Fairy tales to this day still grabbed me. Uh, so it, I think in a way it must have been inevitable for me to do a book like Elijah's Violin. And the others came out of learning what is the tradition to work with. So uh, I'm going to be kind of jumping around here, but I'm curious, who are, who are some authors, you've alluded to this a little bit already, but who are some authors that you look up to? I, you know, have always read a great deal. When I was a kid, I decided to make a list and it made it, it was a pretty thick list of of books, but uh, there's no question that I do put uh, Kafka and Borges and mm -hmm. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and uh, I I was always ready to read non-American authors. Uh, there were also many American authors uh, and poets, uh, primarily. American poets, but still plenty of others like Yehuda Amachai of Israel, um, whom I got to know. And uh, that was a great thrill. So I guess I was sort of torn between writing poems and working on uh, Jewish folklore. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I finally was able to bring out the selected poems with all five books. And I took out a few poems along, along the way. Uh, that felt like I, I've done it. I did that. Uh, I've, when I've had that feeling, I usually am like a carpet bag. I then go and look for some, something new. Mm -hmm. Something new to learn about and to work on. Uh, and I leave what I've finished. The poem Collectors in Library of Dreams talks about collecting both tangible and intangible objects like caves, maps, and sunsets. Are you personally a collector of anything? I'm probably a collector of everything, but uh, my father was a collector. 
uh, he collected watches. And uh, our house was filled to the brim with old watches. Uh, and he used to uh, also collect jewelry, and he would work on it through his eye loop and set it to work on it. His father was also a watchmaker and a jeweler. So he learned from his father. My father uh, became very, very talented at looking at an antique and telling you what country it was from, what year it was from, stuff like that. He was extremely knowledgeable. I don't know how he did it. He read a lot of books. Mm -hmm. But uh, I myself was never very interested in watches. Uh, I was just going to ask, do you, have any of them? do you have any of those watches still? I don't, I don't wear a watch. I never did. Uh-huh. I just never did. Um, so I get to ask my wife a lot of times, what time is it? <laughs> uh, I am a collector, but of books, especially of books of music by those that I really uh, love. And, uh, and then, you know, just, you know, of certain kinds of books uh, where I would want to have every single one. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I, I, you know, working on these stories is also a form of collecting. And Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you, you brought up music. I've got that question further down, but I might as well ask it now. Um, it's a two-parter. One, what's on what's on your music playlist? And two, do you listen to music when you write? Well, at certain, some, certain points I listened while I wrote. At certain points I didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, my top figure has been Bob Dylan since I was 16. Mm-hmm. And I got his first album at the Clayton Library. Um, and my mother couldn't understand it. She was a fan of uh, Frank Sinatra. Uh, she didn't like his voice. I didn't like Frank Dylan. Sinatra's voice. <laughs> I love Dylan's voice. Yeah. Although Dylan has lost his voice. But it's still it's good. That prevented him from making albums. So I know. Yeah. I, I, you might think he might have just retired, but no. no. Uh, from w- Dylan, I discovered folk music. Mm-hmm. And I discovered that uh, there are many great folk singers in America. Um, uh, and I started collecting large numbers of folk albums. Plays have uh, been made from your work, uh, including one titled Gabriel's Place, put on in Britain in 1996 by the Best Tellers, based on stories from Gabriel's Place, Jewish Mystical Tales. It's and Gabriel's Palace. Oh, I'm so – it is Gabriel's Tell Us. I'm totally misreading that. Ugh. All right. There's my moment of embarrassment. It won't be the last. And Speaking Head, Scary Jewish Stories, which was performed at the Lex Theater in Los Angeles in both 1999 and 2000, based on six stories from Lilith's Cave, Jewish Tales of the Supernatural. So all that the big lead-up is – what is it like to see your work take on different forms like that? You didn't well, write it as play necessarily. It's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I do have two more uh, things uh, along those lines. Um, Helene Mayer, uh, who works on plays, uh, has spent a number of years now working up a dozen stories. Uh, this is primarily for children. Um, and uh, as plays. And then, just uh, very recently, uh, Deborah Moses, uh, who uh, runs a kind of a play, play, I don't know how to to exactly explain it, but uh, she is bringing out uh, four performances of uh, a a dozen of my stories. And uh, that's, that's, you know, it's coming up, uh, I think the 17th of this month. You know, it, it, it feels great. And all the ones that I've seen so far have been very good. Even a children's, uh, version of, uh, Elijah's violin. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. Reading your work, I, w- I would think that it could adapt very well to theater. So I, I love knowing that. Um, 
there's a um this is a little bit long winded, but there's a terrific short story um by Isaac Bashevis Singer called Zlata the Goat that I used to teach right around Hanukkah time uh when I was teaching middle school. And so for listeners not familiar with the story, uh very briefly, it's um takes place uh, around the turn of the century in a small Polish village. A furrier's family decides that they need to sell their old beloved goat to the town's butcher in order to have money to get through the winter and to buy um, some needed supplies. So the young son, who I, I assume is around 11 or 12, has to walk the, the goat on a journey to the butcher uh, and then ends up getting caught in a in a snowstorm. And the goat and the boy end up taking shelter in, um, in a, uh, in a, in a hay bale essentially, um, uh, and survive. And I'm not giving too much away just to say that the boy realizes the value of the goat to the butcher's point. Around here, and takes him home. Yeah, of course I know that story. Uh, I think I've read all of Singer. I met Singer actually. Oh, okay. Once. I met him three times in fact. But uh, when I was coming back to America from Israel with my wife and we were in New York for a few days, uh, I called up Singer and asked if I could meet with him. And he said yes. And he was very warm, very warm. And it was a lifetime memorable experience. You can imagine. Yeah. Um, I brought with me Imperial Messages, which included one of his stories. Wow. Which he was very glad about. That's right, yeah. Um, I, well, so that, that whole that whole reason for me bringing it up was because I I just had a feeling. I, my question was, were you were you influenced by by his work? I say absolutely, yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, another question I ask, particularly, well, I, I guess it, not just writers, but really of, of any artist that I'm talking to, is is that inner critic question? Um, do do you have do you have an inner critic that that you have to deal with? And if so, uh, is it negative or positive? Well, I, I have a positive attitude toward all of my books. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know I worked hard on them. I know they came out of me uh, and our other sources. But uh, I, I'm happy the way that it's all come out. I'm one of these people who is going, going into old age uh, happy with what I did in this life. Uh, I didn't waste, I waste my life. I'm not one of those. There's a poem by James Wright that ends with the line, I have wasted my life. I, I don't have the feel. I've, you know, made plenty of mistakes, just ask my wife. But, uh, that's not how, how it was. Uh, I feel that I, I did the best I could. And, uh, maybe it could have been, uh, better received a little bit, but on the other hand, I had eight books out with Oxford, and I, I that, that wasn't easy, uh, you know, to maintain. Well, and you know, how for as long as I've known of you, you have been a professor as well. So I was forty in, years at Oxford. So I mean, amazing. So in addition to being an incredibly prolific writer, um, you've been a teacher for for most of your adult life. Right. And also, I, I on a figure, fairly regular basis of about once a month, I get invited to go to a synagogue, usually, and uh, uh, I would speak there. And I would speak about the Jewish folklore in some aspect of it. Um, so it, 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 it filled my life, there's no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Well, I have to ask you the the classic writer's block question. Um, do you do you ever do you have throughout your career have you ever struggled with ideas or or where to go next with your work? I, I think I did between my first book and my first and second book and my third book. Mm-hmm. The third book took longer to come come out, and there was definitely a period there where I seemed, felt lost. Uh, in terms of poems. Uh, but finally it did come out. Uh, the fourth book, uh, a lot of people think was the best one called Breathing in the Dark. And the fifth book uh, I feel very good about. So, uh, 
yeah, I would say that I probably was uh, in that period, writer's block. I probably mm-hmm. was. So you've been described as the Zondak or grandfather, or godfather, excuse me, of local, the local Jewish literary scene, um, something that could easily extend both nationally and internationally. Do you see any new voices taking up your mantle in future generations? Well, not specifically what I've done. Uh, there are many good writers out there, many promising writers. Uh, but I took my own carpetbagger path. Um, do you hope that folks who are tur- uh, tuning into your work for reflection and strength during this time, trying time in the world right now, uh, and and if so, what message do you hope that they take away from it? Well, there's a lot of good material out there, and we need to think about what mythology means to our lives. It mm-hmm. was accepted widely in the world for centuries and centuries. Uh, people nowadays don't have used it as a, a word that means fake, not real. Uh, but it's, they're wrong. Uh, mythology is really actually very real in our lives. And uh, I think it's uh, important that we uh, use it. And the same goes uh, for folklore. Again, this was something that everybody knew, everybody uh, used, um, even though nowadays we we have less and less to do with it. Um, I'm not saying that you need to accept the supernatural is real, but that there is a lot to learn from uh, these ancient traditions. I think um, you put Jewish mythology uh, much more so on the map than perhaps uh, it, where it was when you were, you know, just starting out in writing. Um, and, and I would hope that um, that people really invest more time in looking at Jewish mythology and not just more Greek mythology or Nordic mythology, but I think Jewish mythology has its place right up there as well. Hey, thanks very much. <laughs> I um, I want to thank you for your time and your wisdom. Hey, thank you very much. You've uh, made my day there. Uh, you've made mine. Thank you so much. Thank you.